humans, where to model the lifestyle displayed by a healthy community of cells. Our societies and our planet will be more peaceful and vital. Today, in the Disrupt Everything podcast series, we have with us a very special guest, Dr. Bruce Lipton. Bruce, if I might. You want call me to you say Bruce. hello to you because Welcome. I'm a happy guy, and I am. Are we still on? Hello? Hello? Are we back? Here we are. Yes. Something went wrong. Not a problem. We start from we start again. Let's try it again. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> if humans were to model the lifestyle displayed by a healthy community of cells, our societies and our planet will be more peaceful and vital. Today, in Disrupt Everything podcast series, we have a very special guest, Dr. Bruce Lipton. Bruce, if my if I am if I may call you Bruce, please welcome do. to this road. I am so honored to be here with you. I so appreciate the effort you're making to help the world evolve, and especially getting to the Spanish community. A very large world community needs this information just like everywhere else. And I'm so honored that you asked me to speak here because together we have wonderful things to talk about to help people become healthy, happy, and enjoy their lives. Indeed, one of the most uh, important things in life because this is what we are for, to live, to live and to go through, right? Absolutely. You know, a lot of people, they don't know what the mission is. They came here and the mission is if we get down to all the details, People think you die and then you go to heaven. I say, no, no, you're born into heaven. Because think about the truth. We came here to create. We came here to have life experiences. And this is our opportunity to do so. So we can create heaven on earth or we can create hell on earth. But we're the creators. And if we know that and we know how to do it, maybe we can create better. <laughs> so this is... Our next guest, Bruce Lipton, in the Super Everything podcast series, a podcast about disruption, reinvention, about changing what matters, about, about making a ruckus, about people who are disrupting the world in a really, really positive way. Uh, it's a podcast about intrepid change makers, for, the, for change makers because we are all change makers and we are all trying to make a robust in this society for a better world with uh, with the with the attitude and the, and the right mindset we can do it all of us so welcome to disrupt everything podcast series welcome bruce and now we go for the intro Thank you so much. And I also just want to thank our audience because our audience are people who want to change their life, make a difference, create a better world. And so I call these members who are watching uh, cultural creatives. These are the ones that can create a better world. All of you viewing, you're here because you're looking for better answers. And I think together we're going to offer some better answers. Indeed. Indeed. Let's do it. Yes. <clears throat> Dr. Bruce H. Lipton, he's PhD, cell biologist, and lecturer. He's an international recognized leader in bridging science and spirit, perfect intersection. Bruce was on the faculty of the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine, and later he performed groundbreaking stem cells research at the Stanford Medical School. His pioneering research on cloned human stem cells proceeds 
today's revolutionary new field of the so-called epigenetics. He is the best-selling author of the biology of the belief and the honeymoon effect. He is also the co-author with Steve Maherman of Spontaneous Evolution. Among many other books, if I recall well, five more books which we can uh, say The Wisdom of Your Cells, the, the Biology of the Belief, 10th Anniversary, Trans Transformers, Shamans of, the, Shamans of the 21st Century, The Spontaneous Evolution of Experience, which is a different but same edition, and Music for Shift in Consciousness. Bruce received the prestigious Goi Peace Award in Japan in honor of his scientific contribution to world harmony. And he is regarded as one of the leading voices of the new biology in today's world. Bruce, what an honor to have you here. I, I actually am more honored because uh, as I like to introduce uh, the, the people in your community are, are looking for making a better world and that's the best motivation. The best thing to do is how can we stop the craziness that we're experiencing and create the, the garden that used to be here when we first got here. And and that's a really interesting uh, it brings me to an interesting question is how to how to how to create this garden when we are when we are so mentally broken well the, the problem is this um a long time ago the indigenous people that were first here let's say 10,000 years ago like the native americans or the indians in south america they knew that they were living in a garden And their then work was to maintain the garden and keep keep the garden beautiful. Uh, and this was actually the indigenous people. But uh, once the Europeans started to come over from Europe into the New World, they changed the program a bit uh, because the science that we're dealing with, and this is the mission. What, what is the mission of science? From the 1500s, the mission of the science is to obtain knowledge that can be used to dominate and control nature. Now, I said, well, how's that working out? And I go, the knowledge we're operating from is causing what is called the sixth mass extinction of life. Five times in the history of this planet, life was thriving and some event wiped out up to 90% of life each time. The last mass extinction, 66 million years ago when the dinosaurs were here and a comet hit there uh, 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 the Yucatan Peninsula and this comet was so big it caused the web of life to collapse all the dinosaurs disappeared the forest got lost uh, 75% of all the life on the planet disappeared but today we're in the sixth mass extinction and this one is not from natural events like the others were this is from human behavior where we think we know how to live uh, in nature and yet we are destroying nature the way we do agriculture the way we pollute the water we pollute the air uh, we just don't we're not living in harmony and the human behavior is causing this And the extinction, this extinction meaning <laughs> we're going to disappear. And I say, well, is that a thousand years from now? I go, no. Sa Na NASA, the science community in the United States, NASA, the space community, they have uh, made a study. And the conclusion is, it's very important, that industrial civilization, the, the one we're in right now, industrial civilization, is facing, and I emphasize, irreversible collapse irreversible collapse means it's falling apart and it's not coming back <laughs> uh, and i said well how how long will it be and they say in the next couple of decades 10 20 years so this is not uh, extinction a thousand years from now we're talking extinction within the next few decades if we don't learn to live in harmony with each other and learn to live in harmony with nature then uh, extinction process is happening right now. Uh, is, is, 
So what, what would you say would be the, the best practices to, so if it's, if it's, if we can solve this, what's the way? Well, the most important thing is this, is to change our behavior <laughs> because hmm. our behavior is not supporting the planet. The, as I said, everything we do, polluting and changing the chemistry and altering the water and altering uh, the changes that we're experiencing, we're f experiencing chaos right now. The whole world, everywhere, something's going on. I go, well, everything at once? And I go, yes, because the whole world is facing this extinction. And the, the, the craziness is because we cannot live this way any longer and that it has to break down because you can't build a better civilization on the foundation of today's civilization because today's civilization is causing the problem. So the only way into the future is to have the system break down, fall apart, and then we build a new one. So when people are afraid, they read the news, they see the world is crazy and they get afraid, I say, no, no. <laughs> this is a good sign because if it doesn't change, if it doesn't fall apart, then we're facing extinction in the next 20, 30 years. <laughs> so we don't have a lot of time. We have to change. And breaking the structure is the first part of change because then it allows us to build a new structure. So I just want people not to be afraid when they see the world falling apart because this is a very good sign because it says we, we're heading toward a new way of life on this planet. And Bruce, how can we, how can we support ourselves in this uh, change? How can we, how can we let uh, this uh, structure be broken and how can we evolve with, with it? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, th I think the most important thing is this, uh, physics, quantum physics, the new physics, not that new, now 100 years old almost, uh, quantum physics is the most valid science on the planet. I emphasize that because the number one principle of quantum physics is that consciousness is creating our life experiences. And all of a sudden it says, oh my goodness, uh, then we are changing the earth the way we are living and the way we are thinking, uh, and, and this is physics. So the answer according to physics is, you have to change consciousness. <laughs> we have to change how we respond to the whole world every day. We have to learn to live in harmony, which is the last thing we're doing, because we live in an old theory of evolution from Darwin. And Darwin's theory of evolution is, a struggle for survival on the planet. Like life is a struggle and competition is what's going to make you stronger. I go, no, the whole thing is wrong. Life is not a struggle. We are making it a struggle. Life was not a struggle until <laughs> you did this. Uh, and that uh, what we have to do is we have to change our consciousness personally. And the evolution, therefore, is not you sit at home and then one day evolution happens. No, this evolution, each one of us is creating this world. So each one of us has to become more responsible for what we are creating. And so it basically says, when, how come if we're creating, how come we're not creating heaven when we can? I say, you know, sometimes you can create heaven. I say, when? When people fall in love. Their life oh. could be blah, 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 blah every day. But they meet this person, and 24 hours later, they, oh, life is so beautiful. Life is heaven. Life is great. The food's great. The music is great. Even the job is not so bad. I said, what <laughs> happened? You fall in love, and 24 hours later, you have heaven on earth. The answer is, when we fall in love, we stop playing programs. And the programs that we play are been programmed into our life when we were very young, before age seven. And that when we are thinking, then the mind, the creative mind is thinking. That's conscious mind. Okay, that's the one that's creative mind. Conscious mind right behind your forehead is a piece of tissue 
called prefrontal cortex. This is a part of the new part of the brain, but this is where we are as individuals. This is where our spirit comes into our world through this part right here. The rest of the brain back here is called subconscious. I say subconscious is the same as hard drive in a computer. Subconscious got programs. I go, and these programs are very helpful. I'll give you an example. How long did it take you to walk when you were a child? Around two, you were learning how to walk. I said, you had to practice. You had to stand up. You learned to learn how to move and everything. I say, but once you learned how to walk, it's now a program. I say, so why is it? I say, you got this program before you were two. You could be 102 years old and you're still walking. Why? Because once a program is in there, it wants to stay in there. So I say there are good programs. Oh. Yeah, how, uh, you know, walking, taking care of our health and things like that. But there are bad programs that, where we get angry or we, you know, get very upset with people and things like that. Or we, we make violence, uh, you know, and people are not living in harmony and there's pain and all that kind of stuff. So where does this come from? I say, it comes from the programming before age seven. The simple point is this. The brain is a computer. It is, okay? And I say, you buy a brand new computer, and you take it home, and you push start, and the screen boots up. I say, okay, now do something. I say, no, first I have to put a program into the computer. Then I can use the computer. So I say, a child's brain is a computer. It boots up in the last trimester, the last three months before you're born. It's ready to go. But it can't use anything until you put a program in that computer, into the brain, into the subconscious hard drive. I say, where do you get the program? For the first seven years of your life, you watch the mother, you watch the father, you watch the brothers and sisters, you watch the community. But in the first seven years of your life, your brain is in is like a, 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 a hypnotherapy. It's in hypnosis, meaning whatever you saw in those first seven years, you downloaded that. So how, how, if you're a, a man, generally, generally, how do you behave? I say, what did you download from your father? <laughs> what behavior did he have? Because you were downloaded with that. If you're a woman, generally, of course, you follow what the mother's program is. How do you get that? I said, just watch your mother. You download the program. So the programs in our subconscious, they didn't come from us with our wishes, our desires. They came from watching other people and downloading their behavior. So the fundamental behavior program you have in your brain didn't come from you, but it came from observing other people. I said, problem, did they answer what you wanted in life? And I go, if they didn't answer what you wanted in life, their behavior won't get you what you want. Because you're, if you play those programs, you're going to get what your parents have. So the, the very important part here is that for the first seven years, that's where we get the program. And it's passed from parent to child. We always said, let's say cancer is running in a family. And they say the genes are running in a family. Well, here's a fact of science. There is no gene that causes cancer. Mm. Cancer is a result of programming that is not good for you. Bad programming. And this is so important because everybody wants to kill the cancer cells. And I say, the cells are not the problem. It's the programming is the problem. And that we could change that programming. You could get rid of the cancer. You don't need chemotherapy or any of that stuff. Uh, I highly recommend a book. The highly recommend this book. It's called Dying to Be Me. Dying to Be Me. The mm -hmm. author is Anita Morjani. M-O-O-R-J-A-N-I. Morjani. She had cancer for four years, and her life at the very end of four years, she, she, they had to have machines to help her breathe and to keep everything working because her body's not working. She's on the last day of her life. Why? Because her doctor, the oncologist, said she's going into a coma. When a cancer patient after that long period goes into a coma, that's sort of the end is coming right now. So... Uh, the doctor called the family and said, uh, Anita's in a coma. Uh, she's going to die. 
So they show up, and she was in a coma for 30 hours, I think. She had experience outside. <laughs> she had what they call near-death experience. She was not in her body. She was gone somewhere else out at the space. She had uh, um, issues with her father that she thought she ruined the love between them because she was an Indian woman who was going to do an arranged marriage, and she didn't want to do it. So the day or two before the marriage, she left, and that embarrassed the family and embarrassed the father. And from that that feeling of separating herself from her family and her father, the, the feeling she got from that caused the cancer. When she was out of body, she met the spirit of her father and her father. I like that her father said, what happens on earth stays on earth. It doesn't follow you back up to the source. So he said, no, I love you. I always love you. They resolved the problem. She came back into her body. And the moment she came out of the coma, her body was working. They took the machines off. Immediately, her body started working again. She, she was so thin that the lumps of cancer were all around her neck and around her groin. Lumps, you could see them, touch them. They were growing up. Like she was skinny and the lumps of cancer were big. They all disappeared. Within three weeks, she had no cancer. And I say, look, this woman went to the last day of her life and then changed her mind, changed her consciousness, and the cancer went away just in the last day of life. So it says, well, how long can you go? And I say, well, Anita Majani shows you can go to the last day and still change it and come back <laughs> and be healthy. She's a very healthy person. So the programs that she was experiencing were taking her out of harmony. Now, a lot of people say there are cancer genes. I'm going to give a fact of science. There's not one gene that causes cancer. I mean, what I'm saying is, you have this gene, then you're going to get cancer. I say there's no gene that that's true. The women are most afraid of a gene called the breast cancer gene because so many women have it, and that's where the breast cancer. They say the gene causes the breast cancer. I go, really? And I say, no. The gene does not cause the breast cancer. The lifestyle caused the breast cancer. Mm. Uh, and this is a new science. It says that the genes do not control themselves. Our consciousness, our mind, is what controls the genes. The old story that the gene is like a program in your life is programmed when the fertilization, the egg and the sperm, and say, now you got the genes, now your life is a program, you're going to get cancer, diabetes, whatever in the family. And I go, this is false. The genes don't cause this. Matter of fact, 50% of the women that have the breast cancer gene never get cancer. I say, there's an important point, and that point is, Having the breast cancer gene doesn't mean you get breast cancer. Having the breast cancer gene but not living in harmony, well, that will cause the cancer. So was it the gene? I say, no, it was the not living in harmony that caused the cancer. And this is how, for example, Anita Morjani was living in that uh, fear of separation from her family and her love from her father and all that. And the moment that, was, that fear was gone, the cancer disappeared. So it's a direct connection to show we are creating cancer. It's not genetic. Uh, and they say, but it runs in the family. And I go, because behavior is passed from parent to child in that first seven years. I said, the behavior of the mother, the behavior of the father is programmed by that child for seven years. The Catholic group called the Jesuits, they have told their followers for 400 years, they told their followers, give me a child until it is seven, and I will show you the man. I said, what did they know? I said, what, they, what we now know, modern science. Seven years is programming, and 95% of your life after age seven is not coming from the conscious creative mind. It's coming from the subconscious mind. So are we living the lives that we wish and desire conscious mind? I go 5%. But we're living 95% of the day playing the programs that we got from uh, family. Uh, 
And I go, well, most of these programs are disempowering. Uh, they, they have limiting power to us or, or they self-sabotage us, some of the programs that we got. So I say, are we living the life we want? I say, no, you're living the life that the first seven years programmed you. And I say, well, if you want to change your life, you have to change your genes. I say, never. It's your consciousness that controls the genes. That's the new science, epigenetics. It's the mind controlling the genes. So I say, well, uh, what does that mean? I said, well, you could come with totally healthy genes, but if your mind's not living in harmony, you can create cancer. You can die just because you believe you're going to die. Belief is controlling all of this. So I say, oh, so we've been blaming it on the genes. I say, no, it's the consciousness that controls the genes. That's the new science. And this is giving people power for what reason? The old story, genes control you, you're a victim. The genes came from my mother, my father, I didn't pick them, I can't change them. The genes turn on and off by themselves, that's the belief. And that means, though, the belief is, which we, I was teaching a long time ago called genetic determinism. This is the belief that genes determine the character of your life. You didn't pick them, you can't change them, they turn on and off by themselves, that teaches a person that they're a victim. If you believe that, you say, oh, my life is not under my control. My life is under the control of my genes and I can't affect them. So I'm a victim of my genes. I go, that is the old belief. That's 100% wrong, 100%. Because the new science says your conscious, whatever is in the mind, a happy life, a scary life, a sad life, an angry life, whatever the picture you see, the brain translates that picture into chemistry that goes into the cells and controls genes and behavior. So I say the important part of the new science is you're the one controlling the genes and the behavior. Well, then you're the master that you can control it in a different way. You can, you can make a whole different, different life, change your mind, change your consciousness. And this is how it works. And people say, oh, the mind controls. I say, people have been talking about placebo for nearly 100 years. I say, what's placebo? I say, oh, you have a problem. And here, here's the newest pill. It's even colored purple. There was an ad that said purple pill. It's like, okay, purple pill. And they say, this is the greatest pill. And you take this pill you get better. You say, oh, the pill healed me. And then I say, there was only sugar in the pill. It wasn't even a real pill. And I said, then what healed me? And I go, the belief that the pill was going to heal you. That's called positive thinking placebo effect. The placebo effect is you healed yourself. It wasn't the pill. It wasn't the treatment. It was your mind that healed you. And now that's very powerful. That's very, let's make a point. Positive thinking, very powerful, can heal you using a sugar pill. So it wasn't the pill, it was the <laughs> thing. But now the most important part that people did not get, and this I'd like to emphasize this part, and this part is negative thinking is also powerful. It's the same as positive thinking, powerful. Well, I can create a beautiful life with positive thinking, I can actually cause cancer and kill myself with negative thinking. I don't need any gene for that. It just has to be in my conscious mind. So thinking is powerful. Now that says, well, thinking positive moves you toward health. Thinking negative moves you toward disease and death. And all of a sudden it's like, stop looking at the genes. It has nothing to do with it. It all has to do, what are your thoughts? Are you a happy person or are you afraid? Uh, you scared about the future? or you don't worry about the future. Each one of those is a different thought, <laughs> and a different thought changes the biology. Those that are afraid of the future lose their power because when you're afraid, you give up and you say, somebody else, somebody else take care of me, like the government. I go, the government's not going to take care of us. That's what we think. I go, no, the government's not going to. They can't even take care of themselves. How are they going to take care of us? And the point is, you want to take care of it. You have to do it yourself. Don't wait for somebody else because they can't do it unless you do it. And this is the wake-up call. Right now, the world's falling apart. I go, reason? Because the way we've been living is causing extinction process. 
resolution. How do we get out? I say, change the way you're thinking. <laughs> That's it. Okay. And stop being in the negative because whatever you're thinking about negative, you're going to create negative. Our thoughts are creating our life. And then I say, so what are your thoughts? And if you think about it, science tells us 60% or more, more than half of your thoughts are negative. They're disempowering. Uh, the, you know, the, the, they're causing the issues we have, negative thinking. And I go, well, you're the one that makes the thoughts. If you change your thinking, then you can change your life. And I go, this is what Anita Morjani did. <laughs> she got out of body, saw what was going on, said, oh, my thinking was, I, I was living in fear. I was, you know, I was afraid and all this. She says, I don't need to do that anymore. And she came back with no negative thinking and the cancer went away immediately. Bruce, how can we, how come, uh, it, it, uh, this uh, brings me to two questions. Yes. How can, how can we change this programming and how can <laughs> we live in harmony? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, now, the, the changing the programming is where the problems come from. Because we always used to think, well, if I just think the positive thought, my life will change. And I go, no, <laughs> because positive thinking does not change the subconscious. Positive thinking is conscious, creative. This is conscious, creative. This is program. I can think of anything I want. I've got two heads. I can say anything I want. But the subconscious has got a program. It doesn't, it, it, whatever the program is, a good program, that's powerful. If it's a bad program, it take away your power. So I go, so the programs that we're talking about that control your life are not from the wishes and creative conscious mind. That's only 5% of the day. 95% of the day, your life is the program that you downloaded before age seven. And, and this, I said, where'd you get them? I said, from parents and community. And I go, Again, their behavior doesn't support what you want. You want something different. Their behavior is supporting what they're doing. And if you download their behavior, then you're not exercising what you want. You're just going to replay their behavior. That's how children come out and are almost like the parents when they grow up because they learn the behavior as kids from observing the parents. And then 95% of their life, comes from that 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 programming you know as i said the jesuits give me the child until seven i will show you the man what they knew was seven years where the program went in and the rest of your life 95 percent comes from that program so if you have a good program then great 95 percent of the life you're going to create good things but if you have a negative program a program that doesn't support you then 95 percent of your life you're going to sabotage your own life And then we blame it on other people. I go, why? You ready? And this is the hard part. The conscious mind is creative. This is very important. This is what makes humans different than all the other animals. We have imagination. If you have imagination, then you can create. I have. If I have imagination, I want to go to the moon. Guess what? We can create a rocket ship and go to the moon. Okay? So imagination uh, is really our, our creative part. But we only use that conscious mind 5% of the day. I say, how come only 5%? I go, because the, the conscious mind, which, okay, idea. Think of the body as a car, and my hands are on the steering wheel. I say, where am I going? I say, when the conscious mind is driving, it's wishes and desires. I'm going toward ha happiness and health and love and joy when my conscious mind is, conscious mind is working. But 90, this is, the, this is it, the whole problem, right? 95% of the day, the conscious mind is thinking. I said, so what? I go, well, if you're driving the car, you have to look out the window to see where you're going so you can go to where you want to go. But if you're thinking, and this is the problem, thinking is inside. It's inside. I said, when I'm having a thought, I'm not looking out the window. I'm having a thought. I'm looking inside. I said, well, if you're driving the car and you stop looking out the window, and now you're looking inside. I said, then who's going to drive the car because you're driving the car? I say, and this is it. The subconscious is autopilot. 
If the conscious mind lets go of the wheel because it's thinking, the subconscious grabs the wheel and drives the vehicle according to the programs. If you had good driver education, then you're driving the car beautifully. Yeah, bad driver education, you're a menace on the road. Why? You're just playing a program. Does the conscious mind see it? This is, that's you, your spirit, your consciousness. Do you see when you're playing a program? I go, no. I said, why not? And here's the answer, right? Because I just said, my attention of my conscious mind when I'm looking out the window is paying attention to what's going on in the world. But if I'm thinking, my conscious mind is not looking out the window, it's looking inside. So when you're thinking, you don't even see what's going on but the subconscious is going to run the show, okay? So why, why this then becomes very important is simply this, is 95% of the day is the amount of time a normal person is thinking. I say, yeah, but if I'm thinking, I'm not controlling because I'm inside. And I go, that's the problem. We're only controlling our lives 5% of the day. 95% our life is coming straight out of the program. And I say, but do you see your behavior when you are thinking? I say, no, because conscious mind is not looking out. Conscious mind is looking in. A thought is inside. So whatever behavior is playing from the subconscious, you don't see it. You can't see it. Why? It's automatic behavior. You don't even see it. I go, okay, um, let's say, uh, let's say you, you're in a car with a friend and you've been driving a long time. And you start to get in conversation with your friend and you're talking, blah, 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 blah. You're talking and blah, blah, blah. And then you look out the window and you realize I haven't paid attention to the road for the last five minutes, you know, and here I am. I'm still on the road. I'm still driving. Everything's going. I go, now let's ask two questions. What was your conversation about between you and the passenger? Oh, we talked about this and this and this and this. And then I say, second question. What was on the road when you were having the conversation? The answer is, I don't even know. Why? You did not pay attention to what was on the road. The subconscious was driving. So you didn't even see what was on the road. And I go, this is true for this fact. When you were thinking, the subconscious programs you downloaded before age seven take over the control. But whatever behavior is coming out, you don't see it. And I say, why? Because the reason the automatic is playing is because the conscious mind's not looking. It's busy inside. So you never see your own behavior. Uh, I use a story, 40 years, same story, so I'll tell it again. You have a friend. You know your friend's behavior very, very well. And you know your friend's parent. And one day you see your friend has the same behavior as the parent. So you want to tell your friend, you go, hey, Bill, you're just like your dad. And I say, back away from Bill. Because I know what Bill's going to say. The first thing Bill's going to say is, how can you compare me to my dad? I'm nothing like my dad. And the audience laughs because they've been through this. They, you know, were. Uh, somebody says, no, I'm not like my mom. I'm not like my dad. And everybody can see they are. I say, then explain that. And I said, the answer I just did. I said, when Bill was young, he downloaded the behavior from his dad. So he's got a dad program inside the subconscious. But when Bill is not paying attention, thinking, then the program steps in and starts playing. But I said, does Bill see the program when it's playing? I go, no, you know why? He's thinking. He's not looking out. Bill's looking in. So he's the one that doesn't see the program. That's why he says, how can you compare me to my parent? I'm not like my parent. In his conscious mind, he's not. And but how can you see the program? Everybody else sees the program. Everybody else sees Bill is like his father. Only Bill can't see it. Now, you ready? Yes. We are all Bill. Every one of us is doing this every day. It's the truth. We are using our programs 95% of the day because that's how much time we are thinking. And when you're playing the program, you don't see the behavior. So if you got a negative program from your parent, and 95% of the day you're playing that program and you don't see it, what do you think the result on your life is? Negative. You know, you'll sabotage yourself. You'll destroy yourself. You do all that. Why? 
because your programming doesn't support it, but, and you didn't see it. It was happening automatically. All you see is the result. Oh, I'm not happy. I'm not healthy. I'm not in love. I'm not this. I go, why not? <laughs> and you don't realize that 95% of the day, the behavior you're playing is sabotaging you. You're the only one, just like Bill. You didn't see that behavior, but everybody else does. And this, this becomes the problem for us because our behavior is controlling our life. And I say, yeah, but 95% is coming from the program you downloaded before seven. Now, this is where the problem also comes in because problem number one, I'm playing a program, but I'm thinking, so I don't see the program. If it's a negative program, I'm, <laughs> I'm destroying myself and I'm the one that doesn't see it because I'm thinking, okay? Uh, uh, and then the issue really comes to understanding this is that the, the programs you are playing came from other people who didn't support what you wanted. And if they have a defect in their life, you got downloaded with a program that has a defect. Myself, where did I learn how to have a relationship with somebody else? And the answer is, I watched my father when I was a baby. I go, so what? I say, <laughs> if I, now I know I didn't know that my father was dysfunctional. My father and mother had a very bad relationship. I say, so I say, but I downloaded the behavior my father was using. And then after I got past seven, 95% of my life, I was playing those negative programs and I didn't see it. All I knew was I can't get a relationship. Why I can't have any luck getting a relationship? Because I didn't see the behavior I was playing that I downloaded from my father was pushing people away, okay? I didn't see it because it was automatic. So the issue is you have to change those behaviors. And then I say again, go back, I say, but what are the behaviors? Because you weren't there. Your conscious mind, I say, you got programmed before you were born. Tell me what the program is. You go, I don't know. I go, yeah, you weren't there. I say, you got programmed a whole year from zero to one year old. You were programmed every day by what you were watching. Tell me those programs. You go, I don't know those programs. I wasn't conscious. You were programmed another whole year from one to, to two, another whole year from two to three. I say, these are where you got the programs. And then I say, so what are your programs? And you say, I don't know. And that's true. Why? The conscious mind was not observing when the programs were going in. So you don't know what programs are. But then here comes the best part. 95% of your life is coming from the programs. So your life is a printout of your program. I say, how do I know my program? I say, whatever you like that comes into your life, things that you like and they show up in your life, they show up because you have a program to support them being there. But in contrast, if you want to have a certain thing, a destination, get something, and you're working hard, and you're struggling, and you're sweating over, and you're putting a lot of effort, I'm working hard to make this happen. Why are you working so hard for that? The answer is, whatever that destination is, the programs you got do not support you. And you're trying to override those programs. I go doesn't work very well at all. <laughs> Overriding 95% of the time on a, a computer subconscious, it's a million times more powerful a computer than conscious that has only worked 5%. You do the math. 95% with a million times more powerful a computer overrides forever 5% <laughs> from a small computer. And so the um, issue is you don't change your consciousness, you have to change your program. And then I say, what are your programs? We just said, Look at your life. Wherever you are struggling, it's not because the universe won't give it to you. It's because your own program does not support that. And that's how you can identify your programs. And once you have identified your programs, how can you change or what do you do with them? Um, uh, that always comes up because that's the most important question after you understand how it works. The most important question is, well, how, how do I change the program? <laughs> And I go, this is the critical part. The conscious mind is creative, which means it can think of anything. The subconscious mind is programmed. It's got habits. I go, so what? I say, 
Habits, when you have them, it's a habit. You do not want to change a habit, which is important. You learned how to walk before you were two. I'm glad you don't change your habit because you'll forget how to walk. I say, nope, same program you learned before two can carry you 100 years, same program, okay? Habits do not want to change because if a habit changes, then by definition, it's not a habit. <laughs> so the subconscious mind is habit mind. I say, yeah, but how do I change it? I say, there's three ways only that you can control this. Number one, how'd you get the habits in the first place? I say, for seven years, my brain was at a low vibration called theta, which is just below consciousness. And theta is the direct hypnosis line to the subconscious. So when you're in theta, whatever you're experiencing at that point can be downloaded straight into the subconscious. I say, well, how do you get the theta? I say, interesting. Every day when you're up at work, you got a high vibration in the, in the brain. That's, again, with the wires on your head, EEG. The high vibration is called beta. That's like schoolroom studying focused consciousness. When you come home and relax, the vibration goes lower. Now it goes into what is called alpha. Alpha is calm, relaxed consciousness. But when you get really calm and you're really relaxed, guess what? Alpha shuts off. You're sleeping. When, you're, when alpha is off, you are sleeping. But for the next period of time, right after you fell asleep, the brain is operating in theta. And then it goes to the lowest vibration, deep sleep delta. So theta is a period when your mind goes to sleep, it's open for a little while, and theta is hypnosis. So if you put earphones on and you play a program at night when you go to bed, every night you go to bed, just before you fall asleep, you put the earphones on, you play a program of a program about health, a program how to make money, a program how to be, you know, uh, relationships, self-help program, okay? At night, you put the earphones on when you go to bed. And as soon as you fall asleep, you're not awake anymore. Alpha, close, you're in theta, record. Whatever is coming in through the earphones is not going into the conscious mind. It's going deeper into the subconscious. It's called self-hypnosis. You, you put the earphones on, you repeat that. Because theta is not a long period after you fall asleep, but if you repeat it every night, you'll get information into the subconscious. So number one, self-hypnosis, earphones out at night, play a program that you want to be true, okay? And that will automatically happen. This is very interesting. I heard, I heard your, some interviews and uh, when I was doing the research about you, I yeah. heard about this and I started doing this for 90 days. And, and, uh, and how did I change... Uh, like small things that always were negative to me, they changed. Like also mainly with abundance, mainly with uh, love. Like suddenly, like a lot of, uh, lot of opportunities to approach love in multitude of ways. Incredible. Yeah, absolutely. The, this is a demonstration that, and it's fun. Why? You were sleeping. You didn't even have to do any work. You just had to go to sleep and the work would be automatic. So when you wake up after playing this at night, uh, the subconscious will have a new program. And one day you wake up and you're living the new program without even playing the tapes anymore. It's once it's in, it's in. Okay. So number one is hypnosis, self-hypnosis. Okay. But after age seven, the brain is not in hypnosis. Uh, and now consciousness is working. I said, but you can still learn a program. You can learn a habit. I say, how? Practice. Repetition. You want to drive a car? Well, I'm not getting in a car until you practice. Why? Because it's the practice that makes the program strong. And so uh, the second phase of programming is after age seven, anything you practice a lot can become a new program. And so you want to practice a new behavior? You can make a new behavior. you got to practice it. Uh, I think it's funny. The new age people have a saying. Uh, the saying is, fake it till you make it. Uh, and what they're saying is, let's say I'm not a happy person. I want to be happy. 
So I say then all day long, I say to myself, all day long, anytime I can remember, I say to myself, I am happy. I am happy. Even if you're miserable, just repeating, I am happy. Because repetition will create a program that will say, I am happy. And one day you'll wake up. You don't have to say, I'm happy. You woke up because now the program is working. Now you're happy. That's it. You change the program. So repetition, practice can rewrite the program. Okay. Uh, a very interesting point. Actors, when they take on a character for, let's say, a movie role, some of the really good actors take on the character so much in their mind that whatever the traits of that character, the behavior, they read about it. This is the character. I want to become this character. So the actor puts into their mind the belief and everything that, about the character. And next, guess what? Then they become the character. It changes their biology, everything. Uh, Renee Zellweger, she starred in a couple movies, the uh, um, Bridget Jones Diary or the Diary of Bridget Jones or something. That character, Bridget Jones, was 40 pounds heavier than Renee Zellweger. Guess what? When she put that character and played that character and became that character, she gained 40 pounds. And guess what? When she finished making the movie, character's gone. She's back to Renee. She lost 40 pounds. The point was... When you take on a character, you become that character, okay? Actors that are good become that character so much that their biology changes, their body changes, their consciousness changes because they take on a new role. You want to be somebody different? Then make a character and become that character. Practice it like you're going to be in a movie. You design the character you want. And then I say practice like you're really in the movie. And the point is then that character will then become a program and you can have a new program by taking on a new character. Simple as that, okay? So we have two ways now. Hypnosis, earphones on at night. Practice, repetition, habituation, make a new one, okay? And the third one is called energy psychology. I go, what's that? I say, Conventional psychology is like talk psychology, where you talk and you talk and you say, oh, when I was a kid, my mother did this and my father did that and my friends did this, and you play over the story of your life. The interactions you had in those people lead to programs. <laughs> so you got programmed by connecting with these people. Now, the problem with conventional psychology is you replay the program. Oh, yeah, she did that. He did that. You cry. You got a box of tissues. You cry. I say, you're playing the same program over again. That doesn't take away a program. That enhances the program. Repetition. You don't want to go. So I say, energy psychology is not care how you got the program. Energy psychology says, what is the program? I say, well, what's the program? I say, well, we just talked about that. I say, where are you struggling? Trying to find a relationship? Trying to find health? Trying to find a good job? I say, these are things that you want to deal with, okay? So I say, energy psychology, and this is the important part, are processes that enhance what is called super learning. I go, what the heck is super learning? I go, maybe you've seen somebody read a book, uh, and what did they do? They didn't even, t you know, read the words. They just took the book and, you know, they opened up the book like this. Here's the book. They open it up. They take their finger and they go down the page just like this, moving the finger down the page. And as fast as they move that finger down the page, they read every word on that page. So you can stand in a bookstore in 10 minutes, read a book by turning the page, just flip down, flip, flip. So I go, that's super learning. I go, significance. If you want to put a program into your mind y using super learning, you know, this is the part. You can rewrite a program that has limited you or disempowered you. You can rewrite a program in 10 or 15 minutes and walk away a new person. And this is energy psychology. It's not conventional psychology super learning psychology. And and therefore, there we need this. There, there's been an ancient saying, necessity is the mother of invention. 
That's an old saying. I said, what does it mean? It says, <laughs> when we have to, we have a necessity to do something, we'll create something. Okay. And right now, civilization has a necessity. I say, what? We're going extinct because the behavior we're using every day is destroying the planet. So I said, well, then how are you going to stop going extinct? I said, you got to change your program. You got to change your behavior. So it's interesting because energy psychology has just come into our world. And it's so fast and so effective. That's what we need at a time of danger. And we're in a time of danger. And that's why uh, it's so important. And I, I just want to help people. My website, we mentioned before, brucelipton.com. Under resources, I have 25 or 30 different energy psychology modalities, different ones. You could read a little brief statement and then go to the website and find one that interests you. Do they work? 100%. 100%. You can change your life in minutes uh, using these processes, okay? Uh, I know that because my life has changed radically from using these processes. I wasn't even able to write my book, Biology of Belief, until I changed the subconscious program. Uh, uh, and I worked on that book for, oh, five, six, seven years, never got anywhere, changed the program, and then the book was finished within a few months. So Man, it's it important to recognize what is your behavior, where are you struggling? A struggle means not that you're a victim. A struggle means your subconscious program doesn't let you go there. So you don't have to change the world. You just have to change the subconscious program and the world will change in front of you. Bruce, what are the, what are the fundamental principles that, uh, well, if you were about to put your timeline in a timeline, your most impactful personal highlights in one side and the professional in another, what would yeah. the, what would they be? If I if I put what's my professional highlight or yes. which one your professional and personal in a timeline your most impactful personal highlights and professional what would I they be the, the the most important thing I had to do is understand and I'm going to tell you here's where a problem for this number is eighty to ninety percent of everybody out there eighty to ninety percent of everybody if you ask them to test for the belief I love myself. 80 to 90% of the people will not test positive. And I say, well, what does that mean? I say, well, they were criticized by parents when they were growing up, criticized, not good enough, not smart enough, not lovable. You don't deserve this. Who do you think you are? Those things parents say. I say, the child under seven just records them without thinking. What do they record? I do not deserve. I am not lovable. I am not worthy. You know, that's what, that's what the parents said that the child copied it. I go, but then 95% of your life is coming from that program. So that's why 95, 80 to 90% of the people can't love themselves because their program is critical of them. So they sabotage themselves until you change that programming. Uh, and this, this is the, why it's necessary for us to change the program, because until we do, we're just going to create the program as a way of life because it's coming from the program habit subconscious mind and i think the most important thing we need to correct for almost everybody 80 to 90 percent almost everybody is you need to have the belief i love myself for a very simple reason if you can't love yourself this logic now very logic if you can't love yourself and somebody else says they love you you have to say oh well, <laughs> you have no quality control. I know I'm not lovable. How can you say you love me? And so you will push people away. You will push them away because if you don't love yourself, no one will be allowed to love you. And this is why 50% of marriages uh, and divorce because people don't know how to even love themselves. So when they get married, uh, <laughs> they never experience true love because they can't love themselves. And that's the first thing I would put on the list of lists. What can I fix in my life? I go, first check, I bet you 80, eight, nine out of every 10 people, eight or nine out of every 10 people will not have a positive response for I love myself. And this is the most important thing in the whole world because if you can't love yourself, you're never going to experience love. And that is such a waste of a life on this planet yeah. because love is the highest form of, of life on this planet. And uh, Bruce, 
Um, what limiting beliefs did you use and uh, did you used to have and how have they changed? And uh, how have you taped how have you typed into your subconscious mind to reprogram? Which 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 system did I use to change a belief? Yes, and also what uh, what limiting beliefs did you used to have before, and oh, how well, have they changed? Belief number one is I didn't love myself. So the first thing is this: Why was I struggling all my life to find a relationship when I didn't see my own program unconscious was sabotaging love? Because if I don't love myself, then nobody can love me. I had to fix that first, then. I realized that I was trying to write the book, Biology of Belief, and I started three different times, and then it got halfway, and then it just, I couldn't finish it three times. I found out my subconscious mind was protecting me. It said, if I wrote this book and include spirituality, I will lose my scientific colleagues because uh, you can't talk spirituality and science, and I was going to write it. And so every time I got near the spirituality, my mind stopped writing the book because my subconscious said, this, this is bad. Don't do it. <laughs> I had to rewrite the, the, conscious mind, uh, the subconscious mind to uh, change the way the book was written and profoundly change the way the book was written, okay? I, I learned how to um, let things go. A lot of us hold on to things like anger and pain and history, and we hold on to these things. I go, if you're holding on to them, you're living in that. What I had to learn was not let things bother me. And I let go, and I realized so many things we put energy into protect ourselves from negative people and stuff like that. And I'm going, that's a lot of energy. <laughs> what I now find is I save the energy by disconnecting. I'm not there. It doesn't hmm. mean uh, I anger people, I hate people or anything. I just don't let their words affect my psychology. They could, somebody could say, Bruce, you're a stupid idiot. And I would say, yeah, I guess so. I say, why? Because if I say, I guess so, then what else is he going to say? I said you were a stupid idiot. I say, yeah, I agree <laughs> with you. Now what? How many times can you say it? And the answer is, argument is gone. I don't care what that person says. So if I did, I would argue back and forth. I say, but then I'm just getting hot energy, wasting all this stuff. I say, let it go. I don't give a damn what that other person says. We do things. You see, energy is life. That is the most important fact. Energy is life. The more energy you have, the better your life. The less energy you have, the closer you are to death. So a simple understanding is, are you using your energy efficiently? I go, what does that mean? I go, look, we have a bank account and you have a checkbook. I say, do you just go out there and write checks to give away to people? Oh, here's $5. Here's $20. You're a nice person. Here's $15. I say, you don't give away your money. When you write a check, you get something back. So I say, if I give you an energy checkbook, because energy is life, I say, how many things are you doing during the day that you give away your energy, but nothing comes back? Have an argument with somebody about politics. I say, you use a lot of energy. I say, did anything change? Did you get something out of it? So I say, no, you just got angry. I said, then why'd you have the argument? You used all the energy. <laughs> and the point is, well, that's silly. Then all of a sudden you say, okay, no more arguments. Why? I don't need to waste the energy anymore. So if I gave you a checkbook, it says, before you do anything you have to involve yourself with, you ask a question. Does this thing that I'm going to do support me or my community? If not, then why am I doing it? I'm giving away my energy, which is my life. So energy checkbook to me is a real important insight. If you start to think of where are you putting your energy and not getting anything back, stop putting your energy there. That's the main thing getting into arguments or things like that, that, that doesn't help you at all. So I learned to save the energy, and I don't let people bother me. And if things don't work out, in the old days, I used to be so upset. If it didn't work, I was going to make it work. I work real hard. Now I let go. If it doesn't work, now I know there's probably a reason, like maybe there was another way to do it, and I didn't see it. And the universe is saying, this doesn't work. And instead of me in the old days making it work, now I just let it go and say, okay, something else will work. And I let go of the fear. I let go of the anger. I let go of the connections that give me nothing but take my energy. And guess what? 
I have so much energy in my account. I, I, <laughs> I love my day every day. I hang out. I'm a happy guy. I am loving my life. Why? Because the energy I'm spending is for my life and for my community. But I don't waste energy anymore. And I don't do things just because that's the way we do it. I go, if it doesn't return anything, then don't do it. <laughs> that's the whole thing right there. And, and so basically it says, recognize energy is life and that everything you do uses energy. Therefore, you start to get smart and say, well, what things am I doing that I don't get any life from it? I just give it away. And then recognize, separate from that. Being angry at somebody it uses your energy. Hot. Anger is heat. I get angry. In physics, the definition of heat, wasted energy. When you heat up and you're angry, wasted energy, man. You could use that energy <laughs> to have a good time. <laughs> but no, you're angry and you know, you're going to get hot. And I say, well, that's energy that's not useful now. So there's a bottom line that says, you're managing your life. Manage your energy. Pay attention. Only invest your energy into something that has a return for you or for your community. But do not use energy if you get nothing back out of it because, well, that's the way we always do it. And I say, then stop doing it. <laughs> as simple as that. Because the more energy you have, the better your life is going to be. Bruce, is there any auto-hypnosis hack that you are using that we can learn? Uh, any, any what am I using there? Auto-hypnosis auto, auto hack that you are how, using how that we can learn uh, from? Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Are we still there? It seems that Bruce is offline. He will come back in a sec. Hey, here we are. We're back. Okay. <laughs> We're back. I waited. I figured you might come back. Okay. <laughs> um, I was saying that if is there a if is there a, if is there is uh, if is there a if is, if is there any uh, auto-hypnosis hack that you are using that uh, we can learn from? Uh, you mean any technology or something I'm using? No, auto-hypnosis. Auto-hypnosis hack. Uh, hypnosis? Yes, any hack or practice or... No, I just used to use, listen to the programs that you could get on a you know CD or on a stick or download and just let those programs play. Pick the one you want. You want more relationships? I got a lot of the program how to make relationship. Just pick these and, and, and put them on. I said, and at night, when you put them on, remember, it works best the moment you fall asleep. The moment you fall asleep, that's when you're reprogramming. So mm -hmm. I love it because I say, well, how much work does it take? I say... The most important work in changing is go to sleep, <laughs> and then the change will happen. So uh, that's why I enjoy the the self hypnosis program with the uh, with the headphones. That was the first one I ever did to change my belief. I I got a, a tape uh, at that time tape from Louise Hay, and I played that every night. And after a couple of weeks, uh, I realized my life had already changed because. By hearing it every night, I reprogrammed a belief. And it was I and I said, What did I do? I said, I fell asleep. <laughs> I said, well, well, that's the easiest way in the world to learn, fall asleep. Bruce, um, what's your daily what's your daily routine? I wake up. <laughs> that's first. Uh, I, and you know, I'm an old guy. You know, well, that's age, not not from inside my life, I, you know, I'm like 78 almost right now. And I go, so what? I go, I wake up every day and go, I'm still here. And I say, so what? I say, today's another day I can have heaven on earth. Every day is an opportunity for me to enjoy this life. It was funny when I never believed in spirituality for 40 years or more in my life. I was a science guy. But when I studied the cells, I recognized that no two people are the same, and I mean that biology-wise. I mean, if you 
take your cells and put it into my body, my immune system will say not self and eliminate your cells. If I put my cells into your body, your immune system will say not self and eliminate the cells. So guess what? The cells have identity because that's how the immune system knows who they are. So I say, where's the identity that makes us different from each other? On the surface of our cells, on the surface of the cell, there are these what are called receptors. Receptors are protein. They're receivers of signals. Uh, I say, you have receptors. Guess where? They're on your skin. Eyes, ears, nose, taste, touch, pain, temperature. All of these are receptors on your skin reading the environment. The cells have a set of receptors on the just proteins like antennas, like TV antennas. No two people have this, what are called self-receptors, the same set. I said, what is self-receptor? I said, a group of antennas on my cell that respond to a signal in the field that come through the antennas, just like a television picture comes in. I go, so what? And I say, no two people have the same set of receptors. I go, what does that mean? I say, no two people are reading the same energy. Each one of us is reading our own unique energy that comes through those antennas. I go, so what does it represent? I go, well, it's an energy field in quantum physics. We're reading, my cells read a different energy field than your cells do because you have a different set of receptors. So we're not receiving the same signals, okay? And uh, they're called self-receptors, yeah. And the significance is this. Analogy, here's a story, simple. Imagine this is a television set. And the broadcast coming in here is Bruce. So this television set is Bruce talking to you from my program, okay? When I die, no more signals are coming in. Body doesn't even move. It's dead, cadaver, okay? But when you're alive, the signals are being picked up. And I say, oh, well, then look, if this is like a television, I'm playing the Bruce show right now. And then when you're watching a TV and the TV breaks, we say, TV is dead. I go, yeah, it's dead. It's not working anymore. But I ask this question. The TV died, but is the broadcast still going? The answer is, yeah. Get another TV, put it to the same tuning, and it's back online again. I go, what I learned is our identity is not this. Our identity is the broadcast that's being picked up, a field or a spirit, same definition, I say, so that we're spiritual, we're receiving spiritual signals playing through this biology. If the biology dies, the spirit is still there, and another embryo with the same antenna shows up, you're back again, different TV. Does it make a difference if it's male or female? I said, no, that's the TV set. Does it make a difference if the TV is black, brown, white, yellow, red? I go, no, that's the TV set. You're not the that's TV, really you're the podcast. So I started to learn the spirituality part. And and here came the big wake up call when I first like, oh my God, I'm not in here. I'm a broadcast. And, and, and I asked myself a question. I asked a simple question of myself, science. Well, if I'm a spirit and a body, why do I need the body? Why not just be a spirit? And this answer came through my 50 trillion cells. I asked. Why not just be a spirit? Why have a body? And the cells created an answer that came into my head. My own cells talked to me and they said, Bruce, if you're just a spirit, what does chocolate taste like? That's a very deep answer. And you got to think about it. Because when I said, oh my God, this is a device that sees, hears, smells, taste. This is a mechanism to convert our experiences into vibrational energies. Remember I said magnetoencephalograph. I'm receiving a broadcast from self, but I'm also sending back a broadcast, my life experience. And I say, if I come and have a very bad life and my experience is not any good, I distort my spirit. So I come back again. I say, what? Now what I do? Karma. I try to overcome the past, the past one to make it better again to bring back the power. And the point of karma is this. We are broadcast. Our life experiences in the past have altered who we are. So every time we come in, we're not exactly the same as we were when we came in before. However, 
If you understand this, then you can adjust that broadcast right now, clear out all the karma, live in perfect harmony, live in love, live in supporting each other on the planet, live in supporting the planet. I say, why? That is harmony. And if you're broadcasting harmony back to self, then the spirit gets harmony, karma. It gets harmony. And then our life is totally different. And this is what I did in my life because, A, I never believed in spirit. Now I recognize, oh, I, I get to taste things and touch things and I get to smell and feel and see. And I go, wow, what an experience. But then I also said this, well, since I have the choice, then I'm going to only touch and taste and feel things I want. I will no longer, if I did something and I didn't like it, I'll never do it again. Why? It didn't help me. So all of a sudden you start to see, what is your life? Go through experiences. The ones that you really like and make you feel better, you keep those experiences. The ones that took away the power and the joy, I said, then don't do those again. That's a simple. And I said, so what happens over time? The only things you end up doing are the things that enhance your vitality, enhance your love, enhance your life, and all the other things you stop doing them. And you've cleaned up the program. You got rid of all the garbage, the bad programming that took you away from heaven on earth. You can change that. And if you only have good stuff, then everything you do will be good, and your life will be heaven on earth. And that's why we're here. Bruce, I'm... Uh... Yeah. I'm just, this is, uh, it's a very inspiring uh, and very truthful and also tangible way to approach spirituality and science and bring uh, earth uh, down to earth. We're going to just close the podcast with a couple, some uh, rapid fire questions. Yes. Um, um, so what do you want to do differently in your next life? I want to. I, I hope I have enough learning so I can come in the next life and just have the fun without all the learning. Because the learning sometimes is hurt. It hurts a lot to learn. And so I maybe I finish. So the next time I come in, I'm just here to enjoy heaven on earth. That's what I want. I'm doing it now, but I would love to come in and start from the beginning instead of near the end of my life figuring it out. What do you tell me about the time that you took an expected risk? And it was an eureka, or eureka moment. Oh, well, uh, the eureka moment was when I was studying the cells and I saw that the genes did not control the life, that the culture medium controlled the life. And then I recognized the culture medium is blood and that the chemistry of the blood control life. And then all of a sudden I said, oh my God, if I change the chemistry of my mind, I change the character of my life. I said, oh, let's start creating a life built on the love chemistry and get out of the other chemistry so that my life has become this eureka moment as I live every day as if this is heaven. I want to be up every day. I want to experience it all. I want to smell it and taste it. And I love the sun and I love the environment. And I say, so what am I doing? I'm enjoying every day of my life because I came here to experience the joy. Uh, I didn't come here to experience the pain. That was a program that somebody put in. That wasn't me. Now that I have my program is how much happiness can I have every day? I find out there's no limit. You should have as much happiness as you can get every day because this is your chance. Interesting. My mother married, uh, when she was older, another, another man, not my father, uh, Phil. And he was like a cranky guy. I, you know, I didn't like him that much. Was, eh, but he, my mother was happy, fine. <laughs> but he lived to 97 years old. And in the last few months of his life, he had cancer. My mother took care of him at home. And in the last week of his life, he was not there most of the time. He was just like unconscious, you know, like that. And then two days before he died, all of a sudden his eyes opened up and he was right there. And he looked at my mother and he said, I didn't have any fun. 97 years old, going to die in two days. And they go, I didn't have any fun. It's like, well, then you wasted the whole damn thing because we were here for fun. 
We were here for pleasure. We were here for love. We were here for the positive things that we experience in our lives. We didn't come for the negative stuff. That's the stuff we don't want to do. But people live with the negative stuff all the time thinking that's just the way life is. I say, no, that's a program. And we can change that. So, yeah, I decided not to be like him. When I die, I'm going to go, that was great, man. I, <laughs> I, I, bet, I, bet, I bet so. What, what, uh, what you are really good at but you never want to do anymore? What I'm good at and don't want to do anymore? Yes. I'm good at enjoying myself and I don't want to ever do something that I don't enjoy anymore <laughs> because that's a choice. And I have a choice. And if you own yourself, then you can make those choices. But if you form into the community and they say, well, this is the way we always do it. And I go, well, now you're making decisions not based on you. You're making decisions based on the other people. I said, you've lost your power. Your power is you make your decisions. That's the most important thing in the world. What's your favorite uh, childhood memory? Uh, I think the first one, Uh, because it changed my whole life. The first time I looked into a microscope in what's called second grade in school, and I saw living things, amoeba, uh, a thing called paramecium, uh, same, people see all these, and I go, and I saw this other world. I said, oh my God, there's a miniature world that you can't even see. There's a whole world. Well, for a kid, that opened up fantasies. Like, oh my God, there's this whole other world Cells are like little people. They have their own world going on down there. Uh, and it was a joy, but that's what got my interest in cells for my whole life. That's why I ended up in uh, college and graduate school being a cell biologist. That one experience, just watching those cells under the microscope go, huh, an invisible world. <laughs> <laughs> If you could say one thing to God, whatever it is, what would you say? Honestly, right now, yes, which is different than earlier, I would say thank you very much for this opportunity to experience the planet without all the pain, to experience the planet in joy and sharing love and sharing community and being part of a beautiful world, a beautiful environment. I'd have to say thank you because this was not true for most of my life. I was just busy doing like we all do. Got work? Yeah, keep working. I go, yeah, but you missed how beautiful the world was. You have to stop. They say, stop and smell the roses. <laughs> the roses could be there and you walk by them every day you go to work, but there's a time, why don't you stop and smell those roses? They're really beautiful. And the point about it is we generally don't spend a lot of time enjoying the beautiful world that we have. And uh, when you start to take the power back over your life, then you could have the beautiful world every day of your life. And that's what I'm living. What, what is one thing that every person should do? The first thing I think every person should do is make sure that they love themselves. And this is really critical because if you don't love yourself, you're giving away your life and, and that's not even for you anymore because you don't even see any reason for loving your life. Why would you be doing this kind of stuff? If you love yourself, then you're going to create behaviors that give you uh, happiness and joy and health and harmony. Uh, if you don't love yourself, you'll just you'll destroy yourself because you have no value for yourself. And, and loving yourself is the value you have for your life. If you... If you were a if you were on a plane that is about to crash, yeah, who would you want to see? Who would you want sitting next to you? Uh, I I would be connecting with my partner Margaret, who is my my love of my life, and uh, and the woman who I learned how to reprogram uh, and get rid of the anxiety and all that stuff. And I would just spend the time saying how much I love her and how much I love my life because I love her. And then say, okay, get ready for the next one because this one's ending. <laughs> <laughs> what an attitude, Bruce. Bruce. What, a, what a spirit. What a mindset. So last one, if you were about to launch a final message that is broadcasted 
uh, through this TV that we were talking about to every person in the world. And uh, this one single message that changed your programming. Yeah. What would what would it be this message? The message is realize this important fact. This is heaven. This is where we came to create. And if you get out of the programming, then you manifest what is called the honeymoon when you fall in love. That's a creation. That didn't happen by accident. And I say, imagine living your whole life like every day in a honeymoon. Every day it's love, it's pleasure, it's joy, the excitement of being here, the creativity that we can do. This is, we came here to create. Uh, we've been creating a mess, but we could just as easily create something beautiful. So we have to stop creating a mess and start recognizing if we want a different world, then we're the ones who are going to create that, not wait for somebody else to do it. It's us. So, yeah. I think the most important thing is if you know what's heaven on earth, then you will drive yourself to enjoy heaven on earth, which is a beautiful experience. Bruce, where people can find uh, more about you? BruceLipton.com. So simple. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, is, there is, is there anything else you want to add? Uh no, I just want to say, first, I want to thank you, Israel, for giving me this opportunity. But I also then want to extend again, all those that are out there listening have an opportunity to change the world, too. And if they change it and they're living in heaven on earth experience, that enhances my heaven on earth experience. If everyone around me is living heaven on earth, then guess what? I live in a beautiful world. And so the, I just really hope that some of the things we talked about today would be helpful for people to say, I want, uh, I, I want that. I want to be the happy, healthy person. It always reminds me of a movie uh, called When Harry Met Sally. Uh, and the, in that movie, uh, Sally is demonstrating what uh, uh, an orgasm would be like when they're in a restaurant. And so she's pretending to Harry, who's on the other side of the table, she's having an orgasm. And you go, oh, 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 it goes through this. And I love it because the waiter is at another table and an older woman is looking at her. And the waiter says, what do you want? And, and she says, I want what that woman is having over there. <laughs> and I say, good idea. Good idea. Seek the happiness and the joy. We do not come here for pain. Uh, uh, we came here for pleasure. This is you created. Smell the flowers. Taste the great food. All these kind of things. This Use this machine. Smell it, taste it, love it, feel it. It's what this machine is all about. I think it cannot be a better closing than this one. And, uh, and a quote, I, I, it grabbed my attention. I said, I learned again and again in my life. Until you get your own act together, you're not ready for big love. What you are ready for is one of these codependent relationships where you desperately need a partner. Yeah. Love yourself. Uh, uh, one little piece of advice, because I know this is frustrating for most people, and that is this. Being a human, a characteristic of being a human is something called compassion. And compassion is to experience what other people are feeling. And if they're not feeling helpful, compassion is you want to help them. So we are all built with a, you know, a drive to help other people. I just need people to understand this. If a person that you want to help is not ready to be helped, then it doesn't, your, all your effort is, is useless. They were not listening to you. And we put a lot of effort in it because the closer somebody is, the more you want them to, to you know, be better and you want to help them. And I go, but if they're not ready, then all that work you're doing is throwing it away because they're not ready. And, and it hurts so many people because they want to help people and then they put the effort in and it doesn't seem to work. They get very upset. And I go, it will only work if the person you're trying to help wants to be helped. I just need to leave that out because we, all, we want to help everybody. I say, yeah, but most of those people, they don't want to change. <laughs> uh, and then I say, so you're going to be trying to all use all your emotions and your energy to help these people. And they're, they're not listening. They don't want to change. So I just want people to know that because 
Nobody's going to change until they're ready to change. No matter how much you try to help somebody, they will not change until they're ready to change. And we have to recognize this because it will save us a lot of upsetness about trying to help somebody and realizing they're not listening. It's like, yeah. So don't waste your energy until they ask you how to, what can I do? Because that means then they're ready. Bruce, thank you for your time, for your energy, but for your, for your, for the work you do and for bringing and bridging to us down health, down to earth. Well, Thank you again for the opportunity because I said the more people that surround me that are living in heaven, the more I'm living in heaven. And so uh, I'm really hoping that this wonderful audience, a number of them are going to say, I'm ready for heaven, and they're going to do it. I love that. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, this is it. This is uh, Disrupt Everything podcast series. Now yes. you're going to be disrupted. If you don't disrupt yourself, somebody or something will disrupt yourself. Will disrupt Absolutely. you. And Absolutely. now you have a three big techniques for reprogram your mind, as uh, Bruce shared with us: hypnosis, practice and repetition, and energy psychology. Yes. Just do the work, find the others, love yourself, save the energy for the people you need and for yourself and uh, keep living in uh, in he heaven I, I, it works I, I wouldn't say, believe it when i was younger but i sure as heck believe it now <laughs> I, i believe now a bit more than i believed before this interview so thank you yeah. thank you from my side Ezra, and every, everyone's you. side thank, uh, you. Ezra, I thank you so again for giving me an opportunity to talk to this community. I appreciate what you're doing because you're helping heal the planet. And that's the best thing we can do as citizens on this earth is help to heal this place. So thank you. And this is it. Uh, find the books of uh, uh, Bruce Lipton in the podcast show notes, also his website and uh, most information about uh, where you can find him on uh, live events, on online, it will be on the podcast show notes and you've been disrupted.